I'll call down my demons. Oh, demons, <laughs> come on down. <laughs> oh, demons. Thanks for clicking in to Strange Stories with the Seeker and the Skeptic. I'm Jonathan. I am the Skeptic. And I'm, I'm Brittany. I am the Seeker. And this evening, we are extremely pleased to be speaking with Dr. Alan Greenfield. He is a ufologist, an occultist, an author. Uh, we were first made aware of him through the show Hellier, uh, which you know, radically changed the course of our life. So here we are, uh, with, in which references the book he wrote, Secret Cipher of the Euphonauts can't recommend it enough if you want to go down a rabbit hole and have an initiatory experience this is a real good first step for you uh, when we saw the episode that featured him they mentioned that book i immediately paused the show and something told me order this book which i did from amazon and here we are how are you this evening you're asking me i am <laughs> okay i'm fine how are you for for an old guy who's been here 100 and what did i say 162 years mm -hmm. i'm doing fine because i'm still breathing That's how are you doing <laughs> how are you doing seeker how are you doing skeptic i'm doing great stoked to be having this conversation this is awesome well you know there is a statistical thing i know it's got to be true because Rupert Sheldrake says it in one of his books, it's got to be true, right? That those who are skeptical have shorter lifespans. Oh, and <laughs> so, you know, hit that treadmill, get yourself some uh, supplements and uh, check with your chosen healthcare provider. <laughs> yep. Who will pronounce you dead on arrival, but don't worry. <laughs> There's an afterlife. I can prove it. There's also an after party, which is the same thing, actually. Okay, they've turned your program off, so now we can get down to business. Sounds good. I I like to take the idea of skepticism as I just want more information. I'm never going to tell somebody that they haven't had an experience that they've had. Um, you know, I, I feel like the, the debunkers have kind of co-opted that word, and I got a problem with that. So I'm trying to take it back to the the root of i just want more more information more data That's oh th then then i'm a skeptic by that standard because uh i don't have any beliefs what i have are uh current opinions based on the information that i have but always open to new information and also that uh i have uh sort of looked into something or not looked into it. And if I haven't looked into it, I really don't have an opinion. If I have, I probably have a current opinion, but sometimes uh, facts make me change uh, the approach that I have. I mean, when I started out in ufology, I certainly had a radically different opinion than I do now. What did that look like when 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 you started in ufology and, and and about when was that? 1960, back when the dinosaurs ruled the earth. <laughs> and were you still in Georgia at that point? Uh, yeah, I was still living two blocks away from where I am now. <laughs> so, what did ufology look like in 1960? Uh, it was very small and scattered um, there were let's see two organizations of any consequence apro in tucson and uh, uh, nicap at 1536 connecticut avenue in washington dc they wanted to be official you know so that was it I joined NICAP. Uh, I left them a few years later because they had this, what amounted to a doctrine, which is 
Flying saucers are real, and the government knows it, and our task is to get the government to admit it. Sound familiar? That, that's mm -hmm. been recycled recently. And yeah. uh, uh, actually, they had this notion that UFOs were flying saucers, probably from Mars. Nothing had landed on Mars then, so they... It's moved out to Alpha Centauri or some other galaxy, as they used to say in the 1950s science fiction movies that uh, Roger Corman made for $1.45 or two or two dollars for his extravagant ones. You know, he had a star in it. Um, they said they could not land, and had never have. Ergo, all contactees are liars. And as abduction cases came in, they were kind of wishy-washy on that. But even something like the Lani Zamora case, where you had a touchdown landing uh, witnessed by a cop who had no motivation to lie about it, and who didn't come out with a best-selling book on his experience, um, they were very wishy-washy on that. And uh, uh, came a time when I went to talk to the late Richard Hall, their office person, and I went with Gene Steinberg, who does his own podcast these days. And they kicked him out of the office, so the rest of us left with him. And that was kind of the end of my NICAP uh, experience. Years later, I decided that because the 1953 CIA panel had, among many of its conclusions, and you have to put yourself in a 1950s headset to uh, get it, the communists could infiltrate private organizations and create false flaps, which would allow Soviet bombers to come in and bomb America because all the radars and all the planes and all the, uh, what was what was it called? Uh, sky watchers, but there was a technical term for it. Uh, it doesn't matter. In any case, it was a totally, uh, as we say in Italian, facacta theory. Oops, that's Yiddish. But <laughs> be that as it may, uh, it... Uh, the, the report w called for basically denying, 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 regardless of any cases that were good, and to suppress private UFO organizations which were vulnerable to the influence of the Communist Party, which by then were 17 little old ladies and two guys and a and a newspaper that had more of an obituary column than it had members. So, you know, <laughs> uh, but that was uh, shortly after that, NICAP was formed under civilian leadership who promptly resigned. And then the board of directors was headed by Admiral Roscoe Hillencutter, who just by coincidence had been the first director of the CIA. I couldn't make these things up. <laughs> I mean, it's just. Yeah, I wonder if these things are connected to each other. They, um, they might be. I don't. I don't buy into ninety-five percent of conspiracy theories, but it's just very suspect, you know. I mean, their front person was uh, uh, Major Donnelly Kehoe, who, who I met. He was. Nice enough guy, but uh, unlike his office manager, Dick Hall, uh, they're all gone now, so I feel free to talk. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. They, they were first-gen ufologists, and my collection of people were uh, in what was informally known as the teen ufology movement, because we were all not just in our teens, but our early teens. And we were a scattering of maybe a couple of dozen people 
all over the uh, United States and Canada. And uh, uh, some of us are still around, some of us are still active. Uh, quite a few, actually. That's good to hear. Uh, yeah. yeah. Keep, <laughs> keep going with stuff while you while you're interested, you know? I mean, so, so how, oh. go for it. So how does one become a UF? I can't even say it. Ufologist. Or, oh, you said it right. People will say, you foologists, <laughs> and I punch those people out, you know. <laughs> uh, and then they say, UFOologist. <laughs> now, if that's on some, you know, big time radio program, I'm not going to say, oh, Mr. Host. Excuse me, <laughs> but that's ufologists, and they go, "Oh, yeah, okay, you're never invited back." But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, you got it right. That's ufologists, and I don't know. I mean, there's not a membership card or something. Mm -hmm. um, I think people just spontaneously get involved. You mentioned uh, my friends, the the Newkirks, and their uh, entourage that. Uh, are the the hell your people among other things they also have a terrific podcast yep. um and have done some interesting movies as well anyway um they started out as ghost hunters uh and sort of migrated into this in part i think because they read secret cipher for the euphonauts which they lauded which made me very happy, not right at the moment when I saw it, but when my royalties suddenly <laughs> picked up, <laughs> I thought, oh, well, these are really cool people. I really need to get to know them better. And, uh, and they helped me a lot. And, uh, of course, plug coming, plug coming. The third volume, eagerly awaited by at least 10 people, uh, Secrets of the Real Black Lodge Revealed is now out. And early sales reports are great. And <laughs> I think that it, uh, you know, it's a, the subject matter is more, uh, shall we say, darker than the previous two volumes. But uh, uh, especially if you've read the previous two, it's something that you should read. And it will go standalone too because it's it's meant to and it's co-authored with my publisher so you know it, it takes a broader perspective on these things without becoming conspiracy oriented which is i think most conspiracy theories are generated by the black lodge actually so what exactly is the black lodge i'm so glad you asked me that question <laughs> and your dollar and a quarter will be in the mail. <laughs> um, to explain the Black Lodge, I first have to give a qualification for something that I mentioned on, on Hellier. Uh, with some hesitation, the secret chiefs of the Third Order, a commonly used concept in occult circles, in hardcore occult circles, but not too well known outside of that because the notion is that there are people and it's important to underscore we're not talking about aliens or beings from other dimensions in this case we're talking about uh, people who have reached the point of development that they have become ascended masters that is they're no longer corporeal but they try to look out for the rest of us who are trying to slog along and find our way. And they operate either in a direct way or sometimes, uh, most frequently, they use synchronicities. And if you follow the synchronicities, uh, you find your way to uh, higher states of being, uh, maybe not at their level, but at a level. Now, just as there is a uh, cadre of beings who are formerly corporeal humans like thee and me, 
um, there are those people who start out on that same path who move amazingly far ahead of where most people ever go, but for whatever reason, and for lack of a better term, <clears throat> uh, are seduced by the dark side of the force. And some of them, immensely powerful, also incorporeal, um, and for all intents and purposes, immortal, um, choose to work to keep other people from ascending to their level. And because they exist outside of space and time, they have accumulated great wealth. And I don't know, I've never been able to decide whether they can take on physical forms, but they certainly hire a lot of nefarious people, mercenaries, uh, uh, underworld people. We were talking before the program about, uh, about the mafia. Uh, there, are, there are triads in China. There are uh, uh, the Russian mob, which seems to be in control of the country. And uh, they're of that country. They're also in North America. And uh, there are plenty of uh, people who, if you dangle money or threats or both in front of them, who will work for the Black Lodge. So I've never met anyone in the Black Lodge, but I've certainly met their thralls or their. I think the term in the East may be dacoid. Uh, they are people who serve the Black Lodge. They even have had for centuries, um, and I don't know what their current status is because they're very hush-hush, but uh, uh, three different schools that are independent of one another that basically uh, their pitch is we will give you power. And at some point in their development, if these people seem to feel power is its own end, they'll recruit them and uh, uh, nurture them to the point that they become part of the Black Lodge and hence no longer corporeal human beings. So they're sort of self-perpetuating. Does that answer your question? Uh, you might want to ask the follow-up, which you should. How do I know this? Yeah. Uh, in part because of direct investigation of uh, suspicious deaths in ufology, for example. Uh, that's something that didn't get into the book, but I wanted there to be a section that was simply devoted to the number of suspicious deaths uh, of younger ufologists um, that uh, of one sort or another. And uh, that included my first publisher, the publisher that originally did uh, uh, Secret Side for the Euphodons. Uh, wow. He died under very suspicious circumstances. I think he was in his early 40s, which also brought down uh, his publishing house, Illuminate Press. Uh, the book, in fact, the new book is dedicated to him. His name was Ron Bonds. And several of his authors also died under mysterious circumstances, the most prominent being Jim Keith, who was had one foot in ufology and one foot in conspiracy theories. Uh, Kennedy assassination, Jim Stone Files. He did a book called The Black Helicopters which was popular with the uh, militia set. I mean, he was uh, broadly based, but he died under extraordinarily suspicious circumstances. And even Carrie Thornley, there are, I know, three different stories as to what happened to him. He was a little older, but he was certainly not, uh, not an aged person or a person in poor health, physical health anyway. He was a, kind of a well-meaning loony. Uh, I interviewed him once and uh, 
I, I, that interview was uh, recorded. Uh, some guy asked me to borrow the tapes, which I generously loaned him. And the next thing I knew, the whole uh, set of interviews, which were like five hours, is out there as a as a an ebook. Um, so <laughs> you never know. I have no problem with that. I mean, I'm glad to have them do that, but, uh, the tapes are long gone as far as I'm concerned. And okay. what would I play them on? They're cassettes. I have nothing that will play a cassette tape. It's like when I moved here, I threw away all of my VHS movies because they're so, by comparison to anything that's on, the DVD or Blu-ray, it's so scratchy and uh, uh, the tape has this wobble in it. That it's just, and I now have nothing that that'll play on. Right. So, you know, I am I have the current technology. Fortunately, I did transfer some key things to digital format. So, uh that is available. In fact, an interview that Gary Barker did with the original witnesses to the uh, uh, Mothman case, I, I posted on uh, on YouTube along awesome. with my attempts at doing appropriate slides to look at while you listen to Gray drunkenly go on about. But when he does the interview, see, this is this is the thing about Gray Barker. He gets a lot of criticism for some of the things that he did to the pompous people in ufology, little uh, sending them around the corner for whatever reason. And uh, he had a considerable sense of humor, but he also was a serious ufologist. And this tape was something he called Cranes from the Cranium. It was a series of tapes. In those days, pre-internet, he would send it to me and five other people. That was, you know, that was the equivalent of a podcast. <laughs> so he's, uh, his introduction is, you know, shout out to me, shout out to Lucius Farish and a few other people. And when he goes to the interview with the, the primary witnesses at the TNT area, He's all business. That's Gray, the businessman, not Gray, the uh, ne'er do well, the bad boy of ufology, vying right. with Jim Mosley, another friend of mine, both of whom were serious people who were also pranksters. Well, I'll tell you, his, his style of writing was uh, uh, just, just, Anyone who, who wants to have any idea of, of, of how smart he was, read the Silver Ridge and the way he writes what he writes. You could tell how smart he was. Yeah, I consider the Silver Bridge much closer to the truth than uh, Mothman Prophecies. They were both written at the same time. Mothman Prophecies uh, turned into a movie, has sold millions of copies, probably in 62 languages. And... Uh, uh, Silver Bridge, really, if it wasn't for this guy who's republished it, allegedly, because he allegedly has permission to do so. Actually, if anybody had permission, it would be me, but I don't, you know, I'm not in the publishing business. And uh, uh, anyway, the Silver, Silver Bridge almost didn't get published at all because uh, Gray first showed it to Jim Mosley, and Mosley, who is a fact freak, did not like the stylistic form of. And a lot of us loved Gray Barker's style. We called it Purple Press, but it was uh, starting with They Knew Too Much About the Flying Saucers, a book that is a must read even now. <clears throat> For sure. But, but this, that sold very well. It was a bestseller. Uh, Silver Bridge, I don't know, maybe a thousand copies are in circulation, maybe, in all editions. And it needs to be much more 
uh, widely seen than that because it is very close to the heart of what the UFO mystery is all about. And something that, anyway, Jim Mosley didn't like that because it wasn't fact, you know, oriented in the usual way. It was poetic, which is what Gray was. He was a, a, a English major in college, one of the few people of that generation of ufologists who actually had degrees. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's not necessarily make them better than anybody else, but the point is he was right in the center of what we will call the Appalachian Triangle, meaning only that above the Mammoth Cave system, which is one of the most extensive in the world, lots of shit happens. Lots and lots ongoing all the way, you know, from Indiana through to West Virginia and uh, by way of Kentucky. And uh, that's, I, I think, important that someone back in the day when ufologists were few and far between, Gray was right in the middle of it. He was first on the scene for the Flatwoods monster case, first on the scene for the uh, Mothman case and follow-ups, whereas uh, Keel, the other on-scene investigator of prominence during that period, uh, I don't know that it was his first visit, but uh, we, well, actually my father, flew him down to Atlanta to give a talk, and he had a return ticket, but instead he rented a car and told me he was going through West Virginia to see what was going on there. So uh, he was decidedly an outsider, and being a, a native Georgian, I can tell you something from experience. Outsiders from New York are not necessarily knowing what you really should or need to do in order to ingratiate yourself with locals in rural West Virginia or Georgia or North Carolina, the Deep South and even the Upper South. There are sort of rules. I even, sure. uh, when I was, uh, uh, doing my work on the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light, I went and talked to one of the direct descendants of the last frontal chief thereof. And uh, she was a, uh, a high school teacher. And she was reluctant to meet with us. Uh, we went up with clerical garb on and uh, being assuring, and I dropped into my Augusta, Georgia drawl, and uh, we were, we were, uh, I was immediately on a different plane. She said, you know, we had one of, one of these guys from the theosophical gold thing, and he came into my third grade classroom, and wanted to talk to me about my ancestor in the Hermetic Brotherhood of Light. And I said, uh, I understand your reticence. I mean, that's just a, uh, and he was lucky to get out of there not tarred and feathered. You know, it's, I mean, we're talking about backwoods, North Georgia. Yeah. Well, I, my, uh, my, my, my folks live in Jasper, so I, I know, you understand. <laughs> I know how it is. Cherokee County, Cobb County. Um, well, that is, Atlanta is swallowing Cherokee and has already swallowed Cobb. For all intents and purposes, Cobb County is uh, Atlanta now. Wow. That's, I mean, there are old diehards there who still drive around with Confederate flags on their car and stuff. But it's, uh, the demographics have changed completely. So uh, they are a uh, uh, 
I don't want to say dying minority, but let's say a distinct minority now. Uh, and uh, they tend to vote blue if that's any kind of indication. And it's, uh, uh, it's a change situation. It's certainly no longer fighting the Civil War which it was when I was coming up. I mean, that was, they were still teaching uh, in public schools, which I went all the way through public schools uh, here. Uh, they were still teaching the Confederate version of the history of the Civil War. Wow, that's wild. And completely believable from, from what I've read about the, you know, I'm I'm from rural North Carolina, and uh, we, you know, in the 80s, 90s, it wasn't it wasn't like that in the 80s and 90s, but you definitely felt a lot of holdover of that in that time frame for sure. Yeah, well, even still, it fortunately, and I, I don't like to put it this way, but I'm probably one of the last generation that grew up in the rigidly legally segregated South. And every generation after that, and there have been several, uh, it's less and less of that kind of bigoted uh, nonsense. But I think it's important, just as it's important to remember the, the show of the Holocaust, it's important to remember uh, we're recording this uh, on December 7th, the day that we'll live in infamy. It's important to remember Pearl Harbor. It's important to remember 9-11. It's important to remember uh, what it was like, not before the Civil War, which was atrocious, but what was true for 100 years afterwards and the kind of rationales that were uh, around for uh, basically race baiting. For sure. Even to the point of supposedly progressive ideologies uh as, as much as for example the new deal did to help america there was a lot of racist back channeling in that um there's a lot of redlining that, that happened through that program uh you know it it's it did not go away you're 100 percent right it did not go away no it, it didn't start to go away uh until the early 1970s Civil Rights Act was 1964, if I remember right, Voting Rights Act, 1965, uh, both of them Johnson administration. And I think the Voting Rights Act began to change things because politicians began to count. And up until then, uh, the, uh, the number of uh, people of color in the Deep South is approximately the same as the number of uh, white people and now a, a broad mix of people from various uh, uh, socio-cultural and racial backgrounds. Uh, they can count and the uh, Dixiecrats slowly either disappeared or shut up or joined the other party as as simple as that but it was a gradual process and um, is ongoing in my opinion but it's nothing like it was it was horrendous when I was a kid I should write a book about that I'd buy it for sure just like I bought Real Secrets of the Secrets of Real Black Lives Revealed and really enjoyed it Oh, you enjoyed it? I Damn, sure we did. failed. You're <laughs> supposed to be scared to death by it and see the Black Lodge around the corner. It's like uh, we've had all kinds of interference with that book. It took us a year to put it together because of the uh, interference pattern. Like I was worried about my publisher, I think understandably, considering that my previous publisher had died under mysterious circumstances. Um, they were okay, but they had uh, a disproportionate number of family near fatal illnesses. There wow. were all kinds of delays in the book. 
Uh, the uh, printer got it wrong twice, and there's still, if you go through it, uh, I mean, I'm no proofreader, but if you go through it, you'll find uh, this is after 10 different readings, you'll find proofreading errors in it. There was an error on the back cover, and uh, the, I, I saw it, told the publisher, do something about this, and of course, once it's at the printer, it's got, I don't have anything to do with that end of things at all. So right. uh, uh, they tried to get it corrected, and eventually they did. But it's like there are 10 copies out there <laughs> that have incorrect information, maybe even the name of the book wrong. And uh, that, I'm it's not sure very my, funny. It's, ah! uh, my, oh. Mine, I'll, I'll tell you because I'm blurry. My cover says, Secrets of the Real, the Black Lodge Revealed. Oh, yeah, you've got one of the 10. So I got one of the keep, 10. Keep that copy. Because while it is incorrect, and they'd be glad to trade it in for a legitimate copy, think about the dollar bill that has the misprint on it 50 years later. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, all of my books, when they go out of print, they go up into <clears throat> three-digit prices. Why, I don't know. I don't get anything. There are no royalties. No on royalties, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah not on used books. Uh, uh, my eldest son is uh, a screenwriter, and he was involved in the strike a little bit. And one of the things is that, uh, I mean, all of his older movies are on one or several of the standard streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. I don't think he gets a dime for that. I think they maybe for the future there are residuals, but I've heard Hollywood nightmare stories of you know they get paid for the work on and these days get paid very well. But then if there are, uh, it turns out to be a popular item as a vintage matter, or uh, you know it becomes a uh, what do they call them uh, a cult favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, the originators don't go anything. It's horrible that the, uh, uh, well, uh, Larry Fine and uh, uh, Larry and Mo from the from the Three Stooges. Yeah, their yeah, stuff is still about. running. They died in the old actors' home, penniless. Mm -hmm. For sure, I mean, there's uh, a lot of those. Yeah. That was that was that's a total shame people deserve to, to be compensated for for doing good work for sure but i'll tell you i'm never getting rid of this book and uh, i'm sure that at some point you you and i are going to cross paths in real life and i'm gonna have you sign this thing that's what's going to happen okay i'll even say you know something about this is one of the rarest editions <laughs> that we only give to the wisest people <laughs> And I found that wise person, and I stole it from them. <laughs> <laughs> he was a bum in the park. He was sleeping on the bench with the book over his face. So you let him have it and took the book. He said, what happened to my Black Lodge book? I'm a ufologist. Where's, where's my mad dog? <laughs> The old Mad Dog 2020. Yes. What now? <laughs> I'm, I'm working that on it. That stopped you. It's it's the Mad Dog. It's the uh, the after effects. You know how <laughs> LSD does that uh, regurgitation, as it were. Uh, <laughs> mad Dog never leaves you. <laughs> Well, I've I've got a question for you that's a little a little off the the path of the thing we were talking about, but I've been wanting to ask you this ever since I, I encountered that you were active on Twitter and we've we've interacted a little bit, um, and and it's regarding the tarot. Is it okay if I ask a little bit about that? Sure, I think probably. I don't know this for certain. Okay, I like to label things as well as I can. But I started reading tarot cards in 1962. My first reading was for my mother, which should 
you know, I mean, I was just a kid. There weren't a lot of decks available then. In fact, there was only one, the, the weight rider deck, so-called, uh, actually the Pamela Coleman Smith deck. And there was one obscure black and white tiny deck that the Church of Light in California got out, and that was it. There were no other decks in print at that time. And I've been reading ever since uh, in one capacity or, or another. So I may be, unless some Romani people have, some elderly Romani people have been reading longer, I may be the, uh, the eldest reader of the tarot in the United States of America and parts of Eastern Canada. <laughs> Vancouver, I don't know. They're, they're sort of the hippie capital of the left coast. For sure. So a as you have, have done that through time, and, and you know, obviously you know quite a bit about this, um, do you read it more and think of it more in a connection to Kabbalah? kind of context or is it more like an intuitive kind of thing that you go through with the story what is the tarot to you i think all oracles including the tarot um and the Yi Ching, which i consult uh, uh probably more frequently myself the randomization process is extremely important because it, in my opinion, the universe itself is ordo ob chaos, as they say on the back of the dollar bill, and also uh, also in Masonic lore, not coincidentally. Um, order out of chaos. Things like the Fibonacci sequence of numbers, uh, the entirety of chaos theory, not chaos magic theory, but chaos theory suggests that while the universe is truly random at all levels, it also, that randomness produces a kind of order. Now, when you shuffle a deck or you go through the long version of the ritual with the Yi Ching, which is to use the arrow stalks, and it's a uh, time consuming process, but worth it. Um, you are randomizing. Actually, if you use a computer program, uh, your randomization may even be better. I'm not sure because I'm not a techie, but uh, I think that may be somewhere approaching theoretically random. And then you freeze a moment by laying out the cards or freeze the moment by interpreting the hexagram that you've generated. You are seeing things as they really are, where you are, where your question is, and where the universe is. And from that, you can extrapolate a future, although you have to compensate for the fact that if you're doing it for someone else, if you're reading for uh, someone else, which is all that I do. I don't like to read for myself. I might not like what it says. Uh, the um, interpretation has got to be uh, a factor itself. In other words, if you tell a person, oh, I see you getting on a train and having an accident, hopefully, in fact, there's no pur purpose in doing a reading except to say, the corollary is, don't get on a train. And that has to be factored in. The future is multiple. And uh, maybe the past is too, I'm not sure. But uh, I am sure that the future can be modified by the reading. But the reading is accurate for now. and. I think the, the pictograms on the cards, the hieroglyphs, if you will, are designed to let the reader sort of tune in to the chaos become order. And 
after a certain amount of time, I don't even, when I lay out the cards in any particular pattern, uh, I use a five cards just straight across and arbitrarily say it tends to go from past to present to future. But I adjust that intuitively for the, for the reading. The cards themselves suggest uh, interpretations, but you also have your own archetypes within your own mind. And uh, the combination of the two puts you in touch with the moment and you're able to analyze it and come out with uh, uh, something that uh, back in the days that I was uh, working for the Psychic Friends Network, I kept, I had to keep a record of my readings and I did something like 3,000, I had 3,000 clients. Some of them were multiple. In fact, there's a little story that goes with that, but uh, suffice to say, I kept a record of those who called back. The feedback I got, it was 80% correct. And that, that is, some of them were very difficult questions. Some of them were really, you know, simple. Uh, and some of them were kind of tragic, like uh, uh, people who called with financial problems. And they kept calling, and they kept calling, and they kept calling. And the readings would basically say the same thing. But because the network would sometimes put a, uh, network employee and to see what you were saying and I needed the job <laughs> I hesitated to say uh, one way you could economize is to stop making these phone calls <laughs> to the Psychic <laughs> Friends Network at four ninety nine a minute of which I got a quarter you know so oh. whoa that's not a very good rate at all comparatively oh. no wild. no 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 it went to 35 cents for master psychics the last year we did, I did five years there, and the last year the IRS jumped on their case and said, "These people are not ICs, not uh, uh, contract workers. They are employees. You have to do the standard W two thing." And I thought, well, the days of the network are numbered. I don't need to do a reading to know that. And they went out of business. Uh, the, the end of that year so the party was over blame the irs if you must or blame the uh the people who i think prior to developing psychic friends they were odds makers for the you know sports uh, oh i see it's you know it's a logical ex extension yeah, yeah. sure for sure. I always did wonder what happened to the Psychic Friends Network. Uh, that's a, the IRS is a terminal disease, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, well, one can hope it's terminal. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a process for doing readings? Like, is there anything you do, like, before you do a reading? Or, like, are you connecting in, like, with any guides? Or is it just kind of your own intuition? Let me answer that in a, a more broad way. With all magical workings, and I think I'm, I'm typical there, you start out with elaborate rituals and you know, swords and incense and crowns and robes and things. And as you go along, if you're making some success, you find yourself using less and less of the accoutrement. And more and more, you know, your everyday self. And finally, whatever you're doing, it's uh, it's an act in and of itself. And unless there's some very specific reason to be using some kind of a uh, meditation or instrumentality, you just go for it. And the effectiveness doesn't fall off from that, in fact it may even increase. So there's a lot to be said for ritual, but there comes a time when it is just natural for you to put ritual aside. 
uh, I had <clears throat> an insight when I was, uh, I guess, three or four years into Psychic Friends. And again, I needed the job. so um, And I worked from home. And I had given my most recent tarot deck to um, a deserving person because often they, they, they would just want a cold reading, and I'm real good at cold readings, or was. I don't know if I would be now. And uh, I realized I didn't have a deck with me. But they, I said, well, let me do you know, a psychic reading. That's my speciality. Oh, it says you do tarot cards. I want you to do tarot cards. So I envisioned the five cards and pulled them from a psychic deck. And the feedback I got was immediate. That's amazing. Bingo. They say the masters of uh, uh, tarot say that eventually you create your own deck. Well, I have very little artistic talent, <laughs> to say the least. Or you don't need the cards anymore to do a reading. So there you go. I mean, actually, my preference is to use the cards because you need something to, to center yourself, to ground you. But uh, in a pinch, <laughs> I think the cards are already in your head long mm -hmm. since, particularly if you've stuck to the, you know, one or two decks there are now approximately as many as there are stars of this galaxy but uh i think that's true <laughs> yeah there there are quite quite a lot i actually am, am very new in into this uh i've, I've my whole life I've, I've been curious about it interested in it, and i've never really pulled the trigger on it until well the floodgates that opened when we started watching uh both hellier and twin peaks at the same time which if you want to you know, have Boy, that's a double dose. <laughs> it sure Let me was. See if you, is your head glowing? You know, <laughs> a little halo. Yeah. yeah, that's how we started doing what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure, it's changed the the trajectory of everything that we do. Uh, I've picked up a deck called the Magician Longs to See. It is uh, the official Twin Peaks tarot deck, and it is pretty wild. I'm I'm very much enjoying learning through using that. Um, and the the back of it is the floor from the Black Lodge with the black and white. Ah, yeah, which is also resembles the floor of the Sonic Lodges. Mm -hmm. David Lynch knows his stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, certainly. I think Mark. Mark I think Mark Frost, the, that guy, he he's seen some stuff for sure. You uh, can both tell. both of them have. Uh, some degree of background in this. I know Lynch better because I'm a fan of most of his movies, uh, even including the one that he hates, which we'll save for some other program. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a whole discussion. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think that those two gentlemen really were encoding a lot of stuff that was based on real occult knowledge it certainly seems to be the case and of course it's it's good entertainment too but it's also i mean uh in uh secrets of the real black lodge revealed we uh revealed had to be <laughs> in red on the cover that was my one specification um we do have a chapter devoted to the uh, fictional Twin Peaks uh, Black Lodge. But it's not our emphasis. However, that is part of the, the mythos of the Black Lodge, mythos in the Joseph Campbell sense, not in the sense of mythical. It's real enough, wish it wasn't. Would you say that the Black Lodge is, is it an organization? Is it a level of consciousness? Is it a dimension? Like, 
or something else completely different? <laughs> uh, no, it's it's most of those things. I, I would. Uh, it's an informal sort of like I hate to compare it, but when I mentioned that when I was a teen ufologist, we had these little teen saucer clubs and they were all interconnected, and we would talk on expensive long distance party lines on the phone and we would have conventions once or twice a year and uh, I mean uh, some of the first gen ufologists would come to those too but it was primarily uh, our creation and uh, it was not a formal body we all had our own little organization so we could be the the chief cook and bottle washer but uh, uh, and probably the only member, but uh, uh, I think the Black Lodge operates in that way. They know one another, they have communication at various levels, uh, but they don't have an office in Midtown Manhattan with the Black Lodge. Zach Black, president, <laughs> it, it, it on a, on a uh, brass plate uh that that would that level of organization isn't there because for one thing people don't become part of the black lodge if they don't have massive egos ego is what puts them on the darker path uh therefore uh each probably considers themselves to be the most superior of the black lodge but they cooperate on things that they want and that from our investigation seems to have migrated across time in ancient times as they go back as far as you can go uh, they seem to be interested in some kind of solar event that would fry all life on earth uh, which would go back to one of the uh, thoughts about what brought on the Younger Dryas, this sort of period after the last ice age, full ice age, where things got worse again for the environment and then after a thousand years got better. They, there are still people in the, uh, in the thrall of the Black Lodge that are looking for that now. And since the sun is doing some pretty uh, weird things right now, I'm sure that, that that school of thought is cackling and hoping for the worst because it would really be even something medium. Which we wouldn't be talking right now through this uh, uh, system because it would be fried along with... Sure. <laughs> along with the uh, space stations and yeah, every satellite we've got in the sky yeah which would make uh mr musk probably unhappy but you know everything has its compensations but uh i didn't say that <laughs> <laughs> um the other thing that seems to have evolved since 1945, and if you've watched the, the newer episodes of Twin Peaks, it's alluded to in there. It was also alluded to in the uh, series that HBO canceled, Carnival, which uh, was... Very a, underrated show. Yes, very underrated mainly by HBO. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But um, it seems to have attracted the attention of the Black Lodge, who thereafter has a school of thought that would like to see a global thermonuclear war. As I tell everyone, they have no political agenda. They really don't care about people. What they care about is being the superior race of beings and they would like to see the human race reduced to 
uh, a Neanderthal uh, level of civilization. That is, sticks and fire, maybe. And that would be it. And nothing would do that as well as either an asteroid hitting the Earth. Well, they're powerful, but they're not powerful enough to get an asteroid to hit us, I don't think. Or it would have happened. Or to set one group of people against another group of people against another group that winds up creating a global thermonuclear war, which would be a disaster for everyone, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. So that is their major goal. They are bad dudes and dudettes, I should mention. Mm. Is there something that that you feel um, that can that that people can do to to try to thwart that, like on a like a normal human basis, like as people? I don't want to get too political here uh, because I try to avoid that. I used to do political stuff on Facebook, and starting. 2012 electoral cycle in 2016, I got so much hate mail, I decided this is counterproductive. I'm fending this stuff off rather than speaking to things that I can talk about and that sure. uh, uh, people on all kinds of uh, sides of political spectrum are interested in. The, uh, the Secret Chiefs, the Black Lodge, Magic, sure. the UFOs especially now have become almost mainstream. I mean, it's infected the Congress. So <laughs> I may need to get another gig, you know. <laughs> uh, the thing is, it's the same old story. It's the, the enthusiasm is for this uh, culture of expecting disclosure. Ooh, there's nothing to disclose <laughs> that I'm not doing right now for free. And I don't even tax anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so where was I going with that? Uh, yeah. Everyday people can uh, advocate for phased nuclear disarmament. This is a bad time for it. The best time would have been right after the Soviet Union dissolved. But the only countries that got rid of their nuclear weapons were the Ukraine and Kazakhstan. Now, in the euphoria of that period, there was a 20-year span, especially the first 10, where something like phased drawdown of nuclear weapons by the major nuclear powers anyway, was possible. But whereas through the 1980s, uh, those of us who were activists for nuclear disarmament had certain successes, like in the early 1980s, the UN had a disarmament summit and we put a million people in the streets of New York to march past the UN and on to Central Park where we had you know several major musical uh, events and the next day the president of the United States at that time the uh, former actor Ronald Reagan uh, said I wish I had headed that demonstration that that was a time that it was difficult. You needed a million people in the street to do to even get a get attention in the press, and even there, uh, you would get our crowd counters would would count a million. Theirs would count half a million. Uh, it's it's just. Uh, I will allow for the fact that a lot of those were packed under the trees in Central Park in New York. And uh, as I said at the time, it's sort of like 
why we lost the Vietnam War. We don't count the people in the trees. But uh, it, it was funnier back in the day. Um, in any case, if that had happened in the 1990s, where essentially nothing happened, I think we might have had a drawdown, at least in the United States and Russia, maybe in China, because it would have been in their interest to draw down at the same level. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Reagan's pat phrase, trust but verify, that would have to be insisted on because you wouldn't want to, uh, you wouldn't get anywhere if, there, if you weren't sure that the other group wasn't also disarming at the same level. And there was nothing about, you know, uh, conventional weapons. So that, you know, the development of drones and stealth aircraft and all of that would have happened, but we wouldn't be in the metaphysical danger that we are now in again. So what you can do is work for disarm nuclear disarmament on the basis of phased disarmament um, with verification. But you also have to say that as long as the world is as it is, the only thing that has kept, in my opinion, has kept the world free of nuclear weapons exploded in anger uh, since August 9th, 1945, which was the day Nagasaki was bombed, um, is the fear of nuclear war. So you don't want to concentrate on one country disarming and others not. Otherwise, the minimum you're going to see is, well, let's say, a war between India and Pakistan, the most densely populated places on Earth, both of which have a significant nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. So if you want to defeat the Black Lodge, defang it. Defang it by taking away their main toy. We can't get rid of the sun but we can get rid of nuclear weapons if we have the will to do so. Of course, it's not even on the agenda right now, which is just what they want. End of sermon. The mass <laughs> is ended. Go in peace. End of sarm. <laughs> Well, that was a showstopper. <laughs> uh, this is this has been great, Alan. We really appreciate you talking to us. Ah, uh, he's closing me down now, folks, because he doesn't <laughs> want to hear the truth. No, but... not me. I can I could do this for six hours, but I don't know that it's a good idea to. My voice wouldn't last for six hours. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean. I have a question for you because we are about strange stories here. So I would love for you to share with us an experience you've had with high strangeness. Almost none. I, I mean, I've been around a long time. So there, are, there are a few, but it's almost none relative to my interests. And in a way, I've kept those on the back, those few on the back burner because it's like being a reporter. You don't want to become part of the story. Okay. Even if you care passionately about the story, if you become part of it, you're no longer a reporter, you're an advocate or a participant. Having said that, I'll tell you one that scared the living hell out of me, but, uh, and it's, it's almost comical. And I really think the, uh, the secret chiefs may have had a part in it. Okay, this is circa 1965. You can probably date it exactly because there was a program on television. In those days, there were three networks. And this was a program called The Stately Ghosts of England, which I was very anxious to see. It's on at nine o'clock. I think it was on NBC, and I think you may be able to find it on YouTube even now. And uh, that was like the tarot. 
it was a rarity in those days to have something of that sort. So my parents had already retired for the evening. I'm an only child, so I was sitting in the den two blocks from where I sit right now. And uh, I'm watching this program about halfway into it, no, about a quarter of the way into it, I hear this blood-curdling howl coming from the kitchen. Now, the house is built such the kitchen is on one side, I'm in the middle, and my parents' rooms are on the far side. My parents were not practical jokers. Uh, my father, I don't think, ever read a book. He'd read the newspaper, front page, sports page, and the stock reports. And that was it. He knew not anything else. And my mother was not, uh, not prone to comedy. <laughs> my father would try to tell jokes that he heard at the office, and he would mangle them. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny, but not the way he intended it. Yeah. <laughs> it was something like that. Right. <laughs> So it wasn't them. My dog was asleep in the laundry room, which was beyond the kitchen. But he'd never made a sound like that. I'm not even sure that he was capable of doing it. And it was loud and blood curdling. So Alan, about 15, just back from a year in Israel on a kibbutz, which is a tough life. Alan, who had already been five years in ufology and had was dabbling in the occult, I was scared to death. So I ran to get my father. And as I'm running, I'm saying every prayer and protection spell I can come up with, you know, whatever I can think of. And my heart is pounding and I am as alert as I can possibly be. I get to the steps and I think, you wuss. Go back in there. It, it, I don't know. I, I don't remember whether I looked in the kitchen or not at that point, but if I did, there was nothing physical present. So I sat back down because I really wanted to see the program. Calmed a bit, but it's very important to know that I was pumping adrenaline. Okay. So I am, there's no chance that I was in a hallucinatory state or anything like that. 10 or 15 minutes later, the program is still on and it's getting to the one scene where they capture a ghostly image that they can't explain. I'm riveted to the scene, but I'm aware that, you know, stuff is happening. And I hear the banshee cry again. No mistaking it. I am totally alert. This time, I go look in the kitchen. Nothing visible. Dog is asleep. Um, probably woke up momentarily when I came in. But uh, I have no explanation for what happened. And I apologize for my sheepishness at the time. But that's as weird as it, it, as it has gotten for me personally. And I've heard stories you know, from a lot of people who've been to a lot of planets that aren't astronauts. So. Right, <laughs> right. Well, thank you for sharing that with yeah, us. Well, sure. Will that do? That I mean, will do. Absolutely. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! Now I'm looking at my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> What's <laughs> lurking out there? <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't think I would be scared now. I, I've often said, you know, a lot of people are afraid to go through a misty graveyard in the middle of the night. And the truth is, they're afraid of seeing ghosts, and I'm afraid of there being no ghosts there. It's just a different headset. What's behind that fear of no ghosts being there? No ghosts? Yeah. No afterlife. Life. No okay. afterlife. I mean, everybody will. Uh, the only person I've known who admitted to that was 
Jim Mosley, he said, well, all this stuff, you know, has got to be about whether there's an afterlife or not. He was an atheist and didn't believe in much of anything, but he was fascinated by UFOs and was a debunker of everything else. But he, he succinctly put it into words. I mean, all of parapsychology, what else is it about? You know, is there some evidence for personal immortality? And the answer is, yes, there's evidence, but there's no proof. So I'd rather see the ghost. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's a scary ghost or not. Hell, if it ate me, I figure, well, I'm going to be a ghost. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll have to contact me through the Ouija board. <laughs> I, I would be lying if I didn't say that part of my interest in this stuff is is that same question. Um, you know, I would I would like to think that something goes on of the of the intellect after. I certainly want that to be the case. Um, I doubt it's anything that anyone mainstream wise thinks it is. Period. But that is, I think, an understandable stance. There was a book way back called The Denial of Death. It was from one of the famous doctors at one of the famous clinics, Mayo Clinic or whatever. And I think that we live in a death-denying society. And that impairs our ability to, I don't know if be objective is the right thing. I'm not even sure that objectivity is something human beings are capable of doing, but we can approximate it if we know our own motivations pretty well. And the fact is half of my library are books about near-death experiences, reincarnation, and they're all, you know, from academics. I don't particularly care for the pop stuff where the two plumbers from New Jersey go out to the house that's supposedly haunted, and every time they hear a rat in the wall, it's, get out the meters, okay. Oh, I can, I can see, it's electromagnetic proof of survival. No proof of gullibility. And I'm only interested in, but there is a case to be made that with, Unfortunately, they seem to have dropped the ball on that, but the Society for Psychical Research, which has been around for, oh, 120, 130 years, something like that, um, in their early days, they did a lot of research on ghosts and documenting cases, apparitions of the dead, apparitions of the living, apparitions that interacted with people, all the, you know, the different things. They also seem to take a broad interest in mediumship and there may be real mediumship i don't know but i do know it's easy enough to fake and therefore as an evidential thing not particularly but ghosts are evidential of something the reincarnation cases occasionally include memories of a between life state that sounds a lot like ghost cases frankly and then near-death experiences seem to sort of be the other end of that same cycle. So you can do a cycle where verified ghost cases, verified child reincarnation cases, no hypnosis involved, because the hypnosis cases are debatable. Uh, it's too easy to be influenced by the hypnotists or other people who are present or whatever. Right. I mean, they could be real, but they could also be memorex, as they used to say. Um, and uh, the near-death experience cases, they can't obviously be totally dead and rotted away, because people who are totally dead and rotted away, they may exist, but they don't come back in that body, or if they do, it's uh, Night of the Living Dead, <laughs> and I, I mm. don't think that we need to uh, encourage that. But if you put all those, the verified stuff together, along with 
uh, the academic parapsychologists' uh, study of various forms of ESP. It's suggestive, strongly suggestive as a whole of survival. It doesn't prove it, might not be true. There's only one way to find out for absolute sure. I'm in no hurry, no hurry here. <laughs> but seriously. I'm now coming through on this channel. Um. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, you know, but you keep in mind that human bias, no matter what you say, you know, you can be a staunch humanist, atheist, say, I don't care about it. It's just the end and there's nothing to, you can't fear, there's nobody can, bullshit. We have zillions of years of evolution, as Freud once put it, uh, he said, the first time a unicellular organism moved away from dying towards not dying because it was more painful to die, that was where life actually begins. And I think that, you know, we have millions of years of biological evolution that is geared towards surviving as long as you can. You know, sure. survive, reproduce, and keep the family going. Uh, that's that's uh, fundamental. And like any other fundamental in human nature, you can't really deny that. What you can do is be aware that that's ticking away in you, whether you feel, you know, uh, uh, frightened or feel like it's no big deal to me or whatever. Um, it's present and the acknowledgement of that presence is important if you are working in any of these fields, especially important if you're working in any of these fields because uh, your bias inherently is going to be, oh, this works, therefore you need to really be both a skeptic and a seeker. How's that a segue? That's Do a I great get one. points? You sure do. <laughs> Gold star. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> where can people find your books, Alan? Uh, wherever fine books are sold. Uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And I've noticed that a lot of the smaller book dealers, not the used book dealers, the smaller you know, regular book dealers are now carrying it as well. Uh, Amazon should be the quickest. And you don't send me an email asking if I have copies for sale because I have my one copy. <laughs> and that's more than I have of some of my books. I honestly don't own copies of several of my books. And in fact, there's one or two that I don't think I've ever even seen a copy. Or if I have, it's someone else's copy. Uh, it has to do with... Uh, between Illuminate Press and the Celestial Lodge of Sirius, there are some bad dudes who've taken the money and run, mm. literally. Including the Red Bishop, who's out there somewhere. Well, he knows who he is. Yeah. Well, maybe he does. I'm pretty sure the name that he was giving was not for real, but uh, he made off with uh, church funds and the lodge funds. Oh, man. And a, a year of royalties from me. So. Oh. That is wild. No, it's tragic. Yeah. And the thing is, even if I knew where he was, what am I going to do? Uh, he's certainly not somewhere. I mean, he was in New Jersey when he was, uh, before he disappeared. He also ran off with his wife's life savings. And she was uh, Filipino on a green card. So, you know, it's just 
That's unreal. You don't have to be in the Black Lodge to be evil. Mm-hmm. That is for sure the, the truth. That sounds evil to me. It's been really, really great, Alan. We really appreciate it. Well, I've enjoyed it because you've asked the right questions <laughs> and allowed me to give what passes for answers. <laughs> <laughs> Dealing so, with things that are really uh, abstruse and spooky. And those are the best things, most interesting things for sure. Yeah, there's definitely some things that are going to keep me up tonight. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. What's that behind you? Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. This is something that you know we both have been looking forward to and we just really appreciate it that's my pleasure and anytime with a little notice as the hooker on the street corner says i'm available <laughs> <laughs> well we would love to have you back on Thank you so much for being here. If you have a strange story you want to share with us, email us at seekerandskeptic at gmail.com. We look forward to talking to you soon.